Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is João Roberto Spot Lopes from University of São Paulo, and I will be chairing this session two on vectors. Number one. This afternoon, we will have some presentations about transmission of Xylella fastidiosa, about also the ecology of the vectors, like host plant associ associations and implications on spread of Xylella, uh, also about dispersal, uh, and also about uh, acoustic communication, like the use of vibrations to manipulate the behavior of the, of the insect vector. So very interesting presentations. There will be uh, uh, some time. Uh, the pr time for presentations will be 15 minutes, so it should be strict to the time. Uh, and, and then we have some extra time for questions and answers after each speaker. And then uh, at the end, we have uh, we invite the, the speakers to be here in front so that everybody can make further questions and we can have some, some discussions. Okay, the, the first uh, presentation uh, in this afternoon is uh, I will be presenting. So. Okay, this is the uh, work of my uh, PhD student, Mariana Bosses Davis. She was not able to come, so I want to present for her. This is uh, her picture on the left, on the upper corner. Uh, this work is, uh, is done, was done in cooperation between, between two labs in Brazil, one from the uh, University of Sao Paulo, uh, the Insect Vector Lab, and also the lab, biote Citrus Biotechnology Lab in Instituto Agronomico, uh, which is coordinated by Alessandra, and, and we had the involvement of several students working in this project. So as you know, uh, Xylella is, uh, Xylella pathosystems are very uh, different from each other. Uh, they are complex. You, have, uh, you may have different uh, Xylella subspecies. You may have different sequence types. You have different uh, variation in, in biology, in genetics, we, uh, even between uh, a sequence type uh, among different strains. You have, uh, you, you have uh, different crops affected, uh, many host plant associations, and that has implications on, on, on vector species that will be involved. So you have different vector species because of different plant associations and different regions. And <coughs> so a big question we have talking to people here is how transferable are, is the information from one system to another like from one subspecies to another, from one crop or variety to another, from one region to another. Here, uh, I will show that uh, at least part of this information can be, can be trans transferable. Uh, for example, there is a reasonable uh, amount of information on vector bacterial interactions developed sp especially for, for fastidiosa subspecies. Uh, studies mostly done in California. And there are st studies also uh, for the other subspecies, but uh, they are more on vector competency, on host plant associations, not much on transmission uh, uh, mechanisms or molecular basis for that. So we can have, uh, we, we can use a lot of the information generated for fastidiosa subspecies and vectors from grapes and uh, part of it we can use for other, for other systems. Um, transmission involves three uh, important steps. Uh, acquisition, and then uh, when the insect feeds on the infected plant, then the bacteria is retained in the, the foregut, and multiply, forms a biofilm, and then the, the bacteria can be inoculated by the insect wh while feeding on a, on a health plant. So, uh, here I'm going to focus on the retention, how bacteria is attached to the foregut. So uh, this is apparently simply, sim simple, but uh, as you know, uh, fl fluid uh, velocity are, are very, very high here. It's a very narrow duct, the pre-Siberian. So we have very high flow speeds and the bacteria needs to have uh, important, uh, special mechanisms to, to attach to the surface in the vector. 
uh, adhesins, ad, uh, are membrane proteins that are thought to be involved in this attachment, in the early attachment and also in the biofilm formation. So some of these proteins, they, they are important to attach to surface polysaccharides, for example, in the, in the cuticle of the foregut, and, form, and then form uh, a biofilm by uh, promoting also cell-to-cell -cell adhesion. This is a kind of a conceptual model for colonization of uh, xylella fastidiosa in vectors. It was developed by uh, Chiellini and Almeida. And uh, initially, the, the cells, first cells are attached. And then you have microcolonies forming. Usually, they are laterally attached. And then at some point, they become polarly attached. And then later, at a later stage, the biofilm will produce like daughter cells, which will form other biofilms. So it's a kind of a stepwise process, and different proteins may be involved in this in several stages of this process. For example, there are two, ty two major types of proteins in the membrane. Uh, one is uh, the type is uh, fimbrial proteins, like pili. Uh, other are uh, afimbrial uh, proteins, like uh, afimbrial adhesins. And afimbrial adhesins are particularly involved in initial attachment, for example. Uh, this is a study. Uh, I'm going to just make a, a background, a review of background information on that. So um, the, some of these uh, proteins have been tested, for example, hemagglutinin-like uh, genes that code for these uh, ephemeral proteins, like like this Xage, XFA, XFB were tested for transmission. They uh, produced mutants uh, for, uh, for bacterial mut mutants for these genes. They inoculated grapes, and then they measured transmission, saw that the uh, transmission was reduced, so it has an effect on transmission. And they measured the population of the bacteria inside the vectors and, and noticed that uh, there was a decrease in the first hours of their acquisition, suggesting that affects the initial attachment, so the beginning of the biofilm formation. Uh, other studies used uh, this technique called in vitro acquisition system, which allows the vectors to acquire cultured cells uh, in, an, in an artificial diet. This is a, apparently a very simple process, but it took a long time for people to, to find out uh, how to get this working. So, for example, uh, the work of uh, Kellini and Almeida in about 10 years ago showed that it was necessary to grow in a minimal medium, and also the transmission efficiency was enhanced by using like a host structural carbohydrate that could trigger genes involved in, in stickiness of the bacteria. So by growing this, this bacteria in these special conditions, they, they can be uh, scraped and placed in, in, a, in, a, in an artificial diet, liquid diet. This is offered to the vector in this like a small cage in a membrane sachet, so the vectors can puncture this membrane parafilm, uh, sachet and feed from this diet containing the, the culture itself, and then they can transmit to, to plants. This is very, very important for this kind of type of functional work because many of these mutants, they cannot grow, they cannot uh, infect plants, or they cannot move systemically, and this will affect transmission. So by using this type of systems, you can, you can work these problems. Uh, so another work uh, that used this type of, uh, of uh, system, they, they, they tested the effect of some uh, membrane proteins and by, by adding antibodies to the sachet together with the cultured cells, and then these antibodies could be blocking these proteins, and then you could test. And this, in this particular study, for example, for, by, by Killeen and others, they found the effect of this ZADI, A1, and E2, and uh, hemagglutinin-like genes, which are afimbro proteins in the blocking transmission rates. In this other study, for example, uh, they, they, they transformed the, the bacterial strains for uh, mutating the genes for these proteins, and they offered these bacterial strains in the diet and, and I measured the transmission at several moments after acquisition, 
to, uh, uh, to uh, in, in evaluate the effect on the initial adhesion, like, uh, like 12 hours after acquisition, or later on they could uh, have uh, an idea about the effect on retention. So you can, you can see here that genes like uh, RPF, the re regulate pathogenicity factors, and also some uh, membrane protein genes could affect uh, either the, uh, both phases, beginning and later attachment, or the beginning of the attachment. So uh, this was for, for fastidiosa, so may, may a lot of information has been generated. There are other papers too, but in, for other subspecies, this has not been uh, uh, studied. Uh, we have, for example, a uh, very good amount of information for expression of uh, proteins uh, in planta or in vitro for, in cit for citrus strains of uh, Xylella fastidiosa. Some, some of them, like uh, Fin A, Zaj A2, they are expressed at different uh, stages of biofilm formation in plant and in vitro, for example. But we, we did not have any information uh, about the role of these particular proteins in the vectors. So in this uh, work, we were testing the particular effect of uh, zad 2 as a blocking agent for, for transmission by the vector. Uh, but to do this, uh, my student had to uh, work on the validation of this artificial diet for the, for the transmission in vitro. And uh, so basically what we did is to use the same system, try the same conditions, uh, but for the citrus strains of, of uh, subspecies pauca. So the, 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 the bacteria is grown in culture for like 10 to 12 days, and then the cells are scraped, uh, and, and, and this is in the minimal medium. Here we did not have to add like uh, galactoronic acid or pectin. Uh, it was, the efficiency was not shown to be improved for subspecies pauca as it was for fastidiosa. So we only grow on XFM, it's a minimal medium. Um, put the bacterial cells in suspension in this artificial diet made of amino acids, as published by Kirin Almeida. We tested different vector species, and we noticed that uh, Macugonara leucomelas adapted very well to this cage and was uh, good at acquiring and inoculating plants. Uh, we used it like the six hour acquisition access period. Here, we, after this acquisition on the, in the diet, we, we put the sacs for a gut washing uh, because you need to make sure that uh, the cells that are, that are there in the insect, if you do a PCR, are not cells that are just uh, loose in the, gut, in, the gut, in the gut. They are really attached. So you, you have to put these insects to feed on a, on a plant, ideally in a non-host plant, so that they can lose this bacteria that is not retained. And then, after, afterwards, you put on a test plant to measure the transmission. Uh, so you need good indicator plants. In the case of citrus, we use the Cataranthus roses. Uh, we also had to develop, and this was done by the group of Alessandra Souza, to develop uh, an antibody against the zad 2 protein. This antibody was, uh, was uh, synthesized for a 34 kilodalton fragment in a previous paper. And this was the, the assay. So uh, basically three treatments, very simple. Uh, in the first one, we used the antibody against uh, this uh, zadi 2 an ephemeral protein. So the, the cells were, as shown before in the system, they were grown in the vitro, and then they were uh, uh, added to the liquid media. In the presence of uh, antibodies against this uh, membrane protein, anti sad anti A2, with this dilution, and then uh, the insects were fasted for one hour, and then placed on, on the sachet to feed on this, on this diet, and then got to wash and then tested in plants. The same was procedure was done for the tr treatment two, except that here we didn't add the antibodies, just the xylella fastidiosa, in the liquid diet. So this is a kind of a positive control. And we had third treatment was the negative control where 
no bacteria was added, just the liquid diet to make sure that the insects uh, were free also from the bacteria. And these are, this was tested at the acquisition by, by Vector uh, using PCR, qPCR, and transmission to test plants, putting the insects on the plants, and then nine days later doing PCR from the plants. And here are the effects on acquisition rate. So this is proportion of insects that were uh, turned out to be positive by PCR for Xylella fastidiosa. So in, when you have only Xylella fastidiosa in diet, you get like 56% on average of acquisition of uh, positive insects. But if you add the antiserum, you get a three time reduction in this rate up to 18% on average. So there is an effect on acquisition rate and none of the negative control insects tested positive, which was important. Uh, concerning transmission, uh, here are the percent of individuals that transmitted the Xylella fastidiosa to the Catarantos plants, to our test plants. And you see that the transmission rate by single insects was 10%. And when you add the antibodies to the diet, you get uh, one third of that. So there is a, a reduction, both in acquisition and in, in the transmission rate. So in conclusion, uh, we, we could demonstrate here in this very simple essay that uh, 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 this protein, ZADGA2, is uh, important for acquisition and transmission. If we didn't have a blocking, a total blocking effect, uh, and this is, uh, can be explained by the fact that the other proteins are also involved. So it's a complex process. So you need to act maybe in more than one protein to, to get a complete blockage. And maybe this uh, ZADA2 can be used to, to, to block Xylella fastidiosa mm -hmm. in a control strategy. And may also uh, be uh, applied to other subspecies. So it was already shown to, be, to work for fastidiosa, for pauca, and may be applicable to other subspecies because this is a kind of a conserved protein. Okay, this is what I had to present, just to acknowledge the, the, the funding ages, especially uh, Sao Paulo Research Foundation, FAPESP, our state agents, and also federal agencies that provide the fellowships to the students. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, I'm now open for, for questions. Okay, <laughs> Domenico Bosco from the University of Torino. Hi, Joao. Uh, nice piece of work. Uh, I, I, I just have a curiosity. Did you experience higher mortality of the sharpshooter when feeding on uh, an artificial medium uh, supplemented with uh, antibodies? Or not? Um, I don't have the data here of the mortality for this particular experiment. But I don't think so, otherwise my students, she, they always complain when they get high mortality and she didn't tell any, anything about. But uh, you, in, in the artificial diet, they usually, uh, you have uh, some degree of mortality. And for example, use like six hours of uh, acquisition access period. We would like to, have to use uh, longer periods, but if you extend uh, too long, uh, over eight hours, 10 hours, they start dying in the diet. But uh, concerning the effect of the antibodies, uh, I don't know. I've, I don't have this information for you. I'm sure she has, but I, I cannot tell you this. Uh, because in our lab, uh, when we do similar experiments with the plant yield, uh, every time we supplement with some kind of protein, like antibodies, I see. Ah, interesting. Well, I will ask her. <laughs> Thank you. Any other question? Okay, well, apparently we don't have any more questions right now, so we can move to the next presentation. So how, now we are going to talk more about ecological aspects of uh, vectors. Uh, so we have the presentation uh, by uh, Jean-Yves Haspli from Institut National, National de la Research Agronomique in Ha.
who will speak about reconstruction of the plant vector trophic networks involved in the spread of Xylella fastidiosa through hybrid capture. Thank you, John. You're welcome. So, good afternoon, everybody. Hope everything is okay. I now will uh, discuss about our project in Corsica, mostly. And I will, uh, of course, present the work of plenty of people that you could see on the screen that work with us. Uh, PhD students that start on that topic and uh, others that work in the field or in the labs. Second point I, I have to emphasize before starting, this is a very preliminary study. We are trying to develop a tool to answer questions. This morning, uh, Rodrigo explained that first we ask questions, then we try uh, to have the good tools, and then we try to answer the question we, we arise first. So I will uh, show you the first results we just obtained about uh, the reconstruction of a uh, trophic network uh, in uh, Xylella uh, and the, the plant associated with uh, the vectors. I start this. So, our main questions are, uh, we try to decipher the interaction between, uh, 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 in, within the networks of uh, insects. As Zhao, Zhao explained just before, uh, this is very tricky things. You have plenty of plants, you have different strain of, vec of, vec of vectored uh, bacterium, and you have uh, also plenty uh, uh, vectors that we don't know if they transmit or not transmit, if they acqu acquire or not the, the bacteria. And all these, uh, in different place, in different time, it change, and uh, the result of that is the development or not of some disease somewhere at some time. And so, to try to answer this question, uh, we have some small question to, to answer before. First, who is carrying what? And carrying does not mean transmitting, but it's a first step in that direction. And second, how many specimens of that species carry that strain? And third, uh, what they are feeding on? and how long they can feed on that, and did they change frequently or not? And uh, at the end, you can believe that maybe this assemblage of insects, vectors, are stochastic, or maybe deterministic, and we don't know exactly how it works, and what are the main questions of that. Can we use the, the communities of wave vectors as a proxy to infer, for example, how the, the bacteria will spread? because they are transmitted by vector. So, of course, the dynamic of the vectors may have something to do with the dynamic of the bacterium. And in front of that question, we have very few tools to, to work on this uh, kind of question. So what we have done, we have developed a network in Corsica with plenty, uh, plenty site where we try to obtain a maximum of information about the how many species are there of plants, uh, what the coverage, how it change, uh, what kind of vectors we are there, and we, of course, collect vectors to try to know if they were infested or not infested by the bacteria, as well as the, the plant, but we are not working yet on the plant. We first try a, a, a first set of uh, experiments on part of that uh, uh, network, trying to detect and uh, uh, predict the distribution of the, of, uh, the, the, the Zilela in Corsica. And when we did that, we find very uh, intriguing results. We find it was everywhere. Everywhere we sampled vectors, at least 10% of the vectors were contaminated by the bacteria, including the natural areas, in places where you have no agriculture and far away from the supposed to be introduce areas. And uh, then we realized that uh, uh, we, we have, uh, uh, we noticed the symptoms, but we have some areas where there is no symptoms at all. 
And we have sometimes 20% of the vectors we sample, they were contaminated by Xylella. So we did that work by PCR. PCR is the gold standard for everything. But PCR is it's a ship, it's very efficace, very effective, it's very uh, sensitive as well. But you can amplify mostly one thing, and if you want to amplify several things, you need to multiplex, and this is very tricky. And if you want to make a kind of delirium, try to amplify whatever you want, then it's not possible at all. So we decide to shift to another method, which is more efficient, but it's in, is still in, in, in its infancy. Uh, this is a method that normally enables us to, to, to capture something we target. So you can capture any single things. You can capture maybe the plant DNA that was being ingested by the vector. You can capture the microbiome of the vectors. You can capture some specific genes of the bacteria, MLST, lo loci, or whatever. You can capture whatever you know you want to capture. The only problem is that it is tricky to, to, to do that. So we start with uh, that kind of experiment. And before going further on this, I will explain you how it, how it works very briefly. So you extract, extract the DNA, total DNA of your insects, and then you try to target the bacterium, the ingested plants maybe, because it's sap, so the level of DNA is very low. And of course, whatever you want, you can identify the vector or you can identify some microbiome specific or not specific one. And to do that, what you do, you cut your DNA in pieces, you put adapters on this, you tag them so that you can recognize any single individual you can treat. And then you make an equimolar pooling of this DNA and you had some probes that you, you have previously built to capture whatever you want to capture. In our case, first, we try to capture the DNA of the plants and all the LMLST of, of the bacterium. And then, once you do that, you make the hybridization, but then you start to have the troubles. How long do you hybridize the DNA with a probe? That's the first question difficult to answer. And this is somewhere you, can, you may fail. And then, once it is hybridized, it's very easy. You, uh, uh, you have, you, you have uh, this hybridization is done with beads that are magnetic on one side and as uh, and, and have straight beading on the coated on, on the beads, and this enables you to uh, to uh, to hybridize with the targeted uh, DNA and to magnet the beads that are positively, uh, well, you hope they are positively hybridized with the target and remove all the other DNA and then sequence this part. So this is a very efficient method that is used to, to probe you on cancer, on pathogens, on whatever, but it is a human matrix, very simplistic, very well known, and we are on a very composite matrix with plants, with different insects, with plenty on those symbionts. And well, this is a dish. It's a dish and it's very tricky to sort out this. Nevertheless, we start to make an experiment with thanks Domenico others that send us some materials that were specifically reared on things we knew what it is. So it's better to know what you try to find than know nothing. And uh, we collect also uh, a lot of individuals, and we also make some small experiments, not yet done, to look for the half-life of DNA in the insects, how long it stands there, and how fast it, car it, it can decay. We design probes, and uh, we design probes using all the RBCL database. So we designed specific probes to capture we, with RBCL. We knew already it was not sensitive enough, it was not specific enough, but we nevertheless tried with that. And we use, uh, we use PubMLST to take all what we need there and build the probes complementary to the target we want to sequence. 
And then we make a final mix of about 5,000 probes and we start with some insects. We built two different libraries to do that because we want to, 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 to study that better and so we want to test some different uh, library. And we develop a custom pipeline to analyze the data, which is also a bit tricky. I will not insist, but globally you sort out the reads uh, by their quality and then uh, you uh, trim the locality areas and uh, uh, you work with and you assemble the, the others. And then you blast. So what we first discover, I, I go fast on this, what we first discover is that when you make a long hybridization, you have plenty of pollution. But we discover also that we have, the mal we have the disease, we can find into the insects the disease and uh, the, the pathogens, and, and we can find several MLST genes. And we, of course, have a partial MLST scheme, but nevertheless, we can identify partly this uh, strain. And the second good result what that was we can capture the plants. So it was a bit tricky to capture the sap. So we believe maybe we capture the tissue of the plant that has been pierced by the insects when they, they try to suck the, the sap, suck the sap. So now there are still plenty problem with that. We have to improve or to optimize our protocol and we are working on that to make this on several individuals and try to decipher the interaction of the different species or different vectors you have in a, in a place, try to see what they fed on, what they transmit, if, if they transmit, and uh, we need also to uh, add some complementary probes, maybe some probes that are of interest to look for specific genes that are, for example, in the interaction between the bacteria and, 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 and the, the vectors, and then uh, uh, we will uh, start a large uh, survey of the different parcels we have already studied and we have already set up in Corsica. So just to tell you that uh, these methods seem to be relatively sensitive, we still have a lot of problem with the quality of the DNA, with the hybridization, but it's very promising and we expect to to do that soon because we have to extend our network to continental fronts where we have already set up some parcel and we are trying to, to make a, a very good uh, uh, network of parcel as well, try to understand how Zilela percolate in the network of interaction between vectors and plant in southern France. Thank you very much for your attention and if you have any question. Thank you, Jean-Yves, for, for the very nice presentation, very important um, technique for our, our understanding of the ecology. Uh, we are open for questions. Um, Pascal, Pascal. Thank you for a couple of questions. How long was your probe, uh, generally in, in, on average? And second question is, uh, you, you, if I understood well, you use for uh, ribulose uh, carboxylase, you use a generic probe, but you need a more specific probe to, to, to identify uh, plant species? In fact, we, we use RBCL gene, which is good enough to identify the genus and sometimes some very uh, uh, distinctive species, but it's not good enough, for example, to, to really go deep into some taxonomy of some genus, because the, the different species of the genus has more or less the same sequence. So adding another gene enables you to go further and to have a better identification of the, of the plant to the species level. So this is what we did. But it, the probes you put in the, in the set, it's whatever you want. There is no limitation to that. You, Uh, nowadays, we, we plan to, to sequence on Novasec, and so there is no real limitation on the number of probes. We already uh, uh, do some, in another uh, study, some experiments with capture with 3,000 different probes. So whatever you want to, to, to test, you can. 
I would say the inverse. We don't have enough target to make a good job. So we don't have enough probe that target specific region to make a good job. We need more. So if there are some genes of interest somewhere, that would be great to add them. There is time for another question. Thank you for this nice talk. Um, do you expect to be able to identify a sequence of host plants in the same individual insect? Yeah, this is exactly what we did. We, 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 we wanted to really identify the, the, the sequence of the RBCL gene in, in one insect. And now we expect to, uh, uh, um, to sequence, uh, of course, we expect also to sequence the MLST loci uh, of the bacterium. And now we, we want to uh, add some mi microbiome gene, specific gene, not generic. So, sorry, I, I use a bad word. I said sequence. In, in fact, I was referring to a, a succession of different host plants. So that's the problem. So we, 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 we build up a, an experiment to see how long, it's not yet treated, but to, how long the DNA of one plant stands into uh, the, the insects. And so we make uh, some experiment where we change the plants and we put them after an alcohol to, 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 just to check if we can find the first or the second or both of the plants and how long we have. So we need still to to uh, adapt and uh, better master the, the experiments. But we, yes, we expect to have this. OK, I think now we have to, to move to the next presentation. Thank you, Jean-Yves. <laughs> now our next speaker is Anna Simonetto from University of Brescia. She is going to speak about mark recapture experiments to estimate the dispersal capacity of Phelanus espumarius. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, today we talk about spread of espumarius. We all know that the Philenus Mario has been indicated as the main vector of uh, Xylella fastidiosa, and we know that Xylella fastidiosa can be spread only by vector or uh, transportation of uh, infected plant bacteria. And what we know about the spread of Philenus Mario? We know that the only stage that can move is the, the adult stage, and uh, we have two main results on how far it can go. Uh, and they are in contrast one each other. Uh, in 1950, uh, Wither, Wither and King uh, uh, made some experiment, and they found that uh, in a single flight, the, the insect can mm, travel for more than 30 meters, and uh, in 24 hours, in one day, it can travel around 90 meters. Today, another, uh, you will. Uh, there's another experiment that found that uh, in uh, more or less two hours, it can fly two kilometers. So, which is the spread of Clinus fumarius? Uh, we can approach uh, the experiment, we can approach the study of the spread in two different ways. Uh, the Lagrangian approach is based on following each single individual. We follow the trajectory and we know everything from these uh, uh, experiment. The problem is that it's very costly, both in time and money. We can uh, use a different approach, an Algerian approach, in which we consider uh, in, in fixed time points what, what is the situation, so the difference in amount and in the position of the individual that we, have, uh, we are following. We decided to follow this second approach so uh, the experiment is a marker release capture experiment, and we focus on two different landscapes, a not managed medio area in the north of Italy and a managed olive uh, orchard in the south of Italy. This is the protocol for the experiment. So the Philenus pumario has been uh, um, treated with an aqueous, aqueous solution of albumin 
that is a specific uh, tested for Philenus fumarius. Uh, then the individual have been released in the center of the sampling area. In the case of the medio area, it has been uh, placed in the ground. In uh, the case of the olive orchard, it has been placed on the branches of the central mm, tree plant. And then a uh, uh, sampling scheme that I will show later. Uh, we decide to fix a time in which we captured all the Philenus primarius and we search for the marked one. These are the two sampling schemes. So the medio area, you found a circular scheme. Uh, the maximum distance is to 20, 200 meters. And then you have a quite complicated situation to map every distance. This is the situation for uh, the olive orchards. Um, you find different color because in each day uh, they sample in a different position according to the color, maintaining the same distance structure. This is done to avoid the disturbance in the previous day, in the following day. These are the two sampling schemes, so three trials in the north and four trials in the south. And these are the number of instead that, that, that uh, have been released, the time of recapture, and uh, how long they have been followed. The mark release recapture permits to uh, measure the, the dispersal distance of uh, the, uh, the insect. So you know where you release it, and you know where you find it. You don't know which is the trajectory that they do. Uh, but in fact, we are interested in measuring how far they can go, not uh, how long they have traveled to go there. Uh, all the distance can be resumed, can, can be synthesized in a statistical distribution that is called dispersal kernel. What we can do with a dispersal kernel? Dispersal kernel is a statistical distribution that allows to measure the dispersal, the spread of the vector. And uh, knowing the spread of the vector, we can know also the spread of uh, uh, the disease. Uh, in an epidemiological model, dispersal kernel can be used also to direct measure the dispersal of the disease. There are different types of dispersal kernel. In uh, this experiment, we use a basic dispersal kernel that is defined only uh, on movement. We don't consider any other variables, but um, it can be included in some way in other dispersal kernel. In literature, we can find different types of dispersal. Uh, the main difference are about the tails, so how, long, how probable are the um, extreme events, and if you consider or not the long distance dispersal in your experiment. What we do? Uh, we adopted the Brownian motion as a descriptor of the movement. So we said that Flinus mumarius move following a Brownian motion scheme. Knowing that, we can estimate the dispersal diffusion equation. And then from the diffusion equation, you can derive the kernel, the dispersal kernel. The key parameter in which we are interested is D. D is the dispersal rate, so how far it can go. Knowing the dispersal kernel, you, have, you can plot the distribution, the, the distance with which you can find your population at a specific time. I plot two different areas at which we are interested. The dark green is uh, the median, so the distance at which you can find at most 50% of your population. The light green, light plus dark, the dark green, uh, are the radius 98%, uh, so the distance at which you can find at most 98% of your population. I would estimate these values. In literature, you can find a method, a naive method proposed and used by Tufto in 2012 based on the simplified approach proposed by uh, Turkin. It's quite simple. You base, it's, it is based on the mis, mean square displacement. You use a linear transformation of the mean square displacement as an estimation of your D. 
and then you simply do the mean of uh, all uh, the d for each time points. Uh, we implement a different uh, approach also, uh, another methodology that is based uh, on the optimization. So because uh, in the naive methods, in some way you lose some information of your experiment doing just a sample mean. In the optimization method, you can use all the information collected during your experiment. So uh, you are simply have to uh, minimize the difference between the theoretical dispersal kernel, the first equation that I showed before, with the empirical one. And it is based on a relation known in literature that the mean square displacement is equal to the expected value of the square distance. The third methodology that we apply, uh, before when I talk about the Eulerian approach, probably I didn't highlight it, that uh, uh, in the Eulerian approach, uh, you can sample only uh, you can have uh, information on distance only inside your sampling site. You don't go out, out of the sampling site to find if someone has go away. This is a problem, it's called a bounded problem. You can try to take account of this problem, making uh, just a little uh, reformulation of uh, the equation. And we try to understand which is the impact of, for this correction in our data. These are the results for the naive methods. So here you have the seven trials that have been uh, performed and the summary of the trial for each of these two landscape and uh, an intermediate aggregation that is based on the different level of, uh, of um, velocity that have been perceived. Main results, uh, there is a like variability on the dispersal behavior of Linus Marius. Yeah, the first two rows are referred to the first day, so how far it goes away from the release point in the first day, and this accounts for the entire, um, the whole uh, lasting of uh, adult stage that we estimated 210 days. The light blue is uh, the lowest level of dispersal, and the uh, blue, dark blue is the highest level. So you found uh, three times difference from one from each other. So it's very variability, it's like variability in the results. Another thing to observe is uh, that it's quite uh, important to define which is your measure. Considering the median distance and the distance which you can find the 98% of the population, you have more than the double less distance. So uh, the need and what you are interested in for can lead to consider one or another result. This is, they are the results for the unbounded model, so the first uh, optimization without considering the boundedness. Re the results show the same pattern, so you don't mm, find any difference but uh, the estimates are lower. And then this is this, uh, the results for the bounded problem. And uh, quite, quite interesting is the results for this trial because before it was 900 and now is more than 2000. Because here in this trial, we found a lot of insects near the bound. So probably they go away from the bound. And this type of correction can uh, in some way signal the, you can understand that it probably the dispersal is much higher than the one that you can measure with these methods. A summary of the results. So the first rows for the naive methods. The naive methods is quite simple, but it uh, leads to an overestimation of the uh, dispersal. The, the unbounded optimization and the bounded optimization show a similar pattern, but with the bounded optimization, you can consider, you can include in your model, in your results, the, uh, also the fact that uh, the experiment is bounded and to include a correction for this. This correction is much higher as much individuals you found near the bound. Thank you.
Thanks, Anna, for the nice presentation. So, uh, questions? Uh, yeah, very cool. Um, my question is, um, why do you think it's so different between the meadow and the orchard? Um, <laughs> it could be a question for my colleague, but the, the idea is that uh, on the olive orchard, they don't need to go away because they found uh, uh, more comfortable with this plain of um, olive trees, so they don't have to go away. They found a comfortable environment to stay. Okay, Nicola. <laughs> it's an inside question. It's not. <laughs> uh, uh, Nicola Bodino, uh, EPSP CNR. Uh, no, I don't want to uh, ask a, a question to Anna because I, I perform the, 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 some of the field trials. I want to respond to Rodrigo. Uh, that particular um, experiment was probably in a, a moment uh, dry. Uh, when the, the meadow was particularly dry, and also probably the moment of the day was hot. Logistic problems, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, we went probably in, a, in not the best moment to release. So I, I presume that they just <laughs> flown away uh, really faster than usual because they, they were in all this method, there is also the, the, the fact that you put a lot of insects in one single point, okay? One, one square meters, more, more or less. So basically, they are more prone to move than usual. I think we, we should consider in, in the discussion of the paper. Uh, well, that's it. Any other question? Okay, I think everybody's quiet now. So we thank you, Anna, for your presentation. So now we move to the other speaker, uh, Domenico Bosco from University of Torino, Italy. He will talk on phenology and host plant association of spittlebugs in Mediterranean olive, olive groves. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, in this last year, we carried out field research uh, in order to uh, describe phenology and host plant association of uh, spittle bugs in uh, Mediterranean olive groves. And this research has been funded by EFSA. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we know that uh, in Europe, spittle bugs are the most common. Uh, xylem sap feeders, unlike uh, in the Americas. And among these beetle bugs, uh, we know very well that the, the most common, abundant, uh, ubiquitous species is Philenus pumarius, which is also the major vector of uh, xylella in, uh, in Europe. Uh, very recently, also uh, other species of spittle bugs like Philenus italosignus and Neophilenus campestris have been found to be competent vector, although they uh, actual role in the field is probably uh, of minor importance. And then among the sharpshooters, uh, uh, the most common species we have in Italy is Cicadella viridis. And uh, the, the about the transmission, uh, Nicola Bodino, a postdoc in my lab, will <coughs> talk later this afternoon about the um, transmission competence of these species. Uh, the idea of the work was to provide uh, a lot of information, uh, <laughs> data set on population dynamics, phenology, abundance of nymphs and adults, uh, their host plant association, in order to be able to feed predictive model uh, that can uh, help in designing control measure uh, that can, uh, that are in or at slowing disease progression in the infected areas or uh, assessing risk in non-infected areas. Uh, for this, we choose uh, uh, four different experimental sites, olive uh, grove agroecosystems that, uh, that were uh, 
uh, situated in two uh, distantly located uh, regions of Italy, Apulia region, that uh, we all know for Xilele, and uh, Liguria, which is uh, close to the Paca region of France in northern Italy. And uh, in uh, each one of the two sites, uh, we uh, selected one uh, olive grove in, the, in the England and one in the coastal area. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the detail of sampling methodology for the reason of time, but uh, uh, NIMS uh, were, uh, of course, uh, spotted and counted by direct observation uh, using a kind of frame, transect. Uh, they were counted and uh, with conservative sampling, uh, we didn't took them. And uh, each uh, nymph was uh, associated with its host plants and the sampling were based on field uh, weekly sampling. As for the adults, we use uh, a sweeping net and uh, also this uh, sampling was conservative. And uh, for the adults, we investigated three different vegetation compartments within the olive agroecosystem, uh, the herbaceous cover, the olive canopies, and uh, uh, alternative woody hosts for the spiddlebugs, uh, shrubs and trees that, are, uh, uh, that were inside or, or surrounding uh, the, 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 the olive uh, trees. Uh, going to the results, here we can see the stage structure and population, each color corresponds to a different life stage. Uh, stage structure and population of uh, Philenus pumarius nymphs on the bottom in the Apulia region, uh, on the top and on the bottom in the Liguria region. And although the, the, the two regions are quite uh, distant, also different latitudes, uh, we can see that Basically, uh, uh, the, 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 the period of development really overlap and nymphs etch in early March and disappear by late May, globally considered. Uh, <clears throat> the same data represented in this uh, graphical form uh, help us to appreciate also the level of abundance of, the, of this uh, nymphal population over the time. And uh, so we can see that uh, really, uh, population, nymphal population peaks in mid-April, more or less in mid-April, both in northern Italy and southern Italy. Uh, when we refer to, uh, not to chronological date, but to phenological date, uh, data, uh, that means uh, we uh, try to calculate the uh, degree days needed for the appearance of the different life stages. Uh, data are not so constant, uh, are different uh, uh, among sites, and uh, the reason for that will be discussed uh, in, the, in the conclusion. But this, is, this kind of uh, uh, data are not so constant as the chronological one. As for the adult population, uh, here uh, you can see represented in red uh, the, the, the adults of Philenus pumarius that were collected on herbaceous cover, in, in green on olive, uh, and uh, in blue on uh, alternative woody host. This is for the Apulia region, and we can see that adults can be found on olive canopy mainly from May until early July. Uh, then adults disappear, virtually disappear from ground vegetation over the summer months. This is also because the, 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 the vegetation becomes completely dry under these warm and dry Mediterranean conditions. And uh, of course, shrubs and trees other than olives are really important alternative hosts, especially over the summer. As for the Liguria region, the picture is uh, slightly different. <coughs> and uh, it's interesting to, to know that adults can be found on olive canopy basically all through the summer. And uh, adults are abundant on ground vegetation uh, through the wool period, spring, autumn, except for a short uh, interruption during July, August, the most uh, dry uh, months. And also in these uh, sites, shrubs and trees uh, actually prove to be important alternative host for the vector. 
As for the other species, Neophilenus spumarius nymphs, this is uh, the representation of the stage structure and population of the nymphs. Uh, of these species that was found both uh, in, in Apulia and in uh, Ligurian uh, olive uh, groves. And uh, we can say that uh, nymphal population follow a very similar trend uh, to the ones of the nymphs of uh, Philenus pumarius, although with a lower abundance. There is a, the development is is a bit delay compared to the one of Philenus pumarius, but they really overlap. Uh, we found uh, uh, a decent number of another spittleback species, Afrophoralni. <coughs> this is the nymphal stage structure population, very different population level uh, between the two years. Uh, <coughs> these uh, nymphs develop later compared to Philenus pumarius. We have a uh, uh, population peak even in, in May. Uh, this species was found only in the Ligurian olive groves and never in Apulia. And uh, the population level of this species was uh, lower compared to Neophilenus campestri. So ranking for importance, uh, by far, Philenus pumarius has the highest uh, population in olive uh, groves, then uh, Neophilenus, and finally uh, Afrophoralni, if any. As for the adults of uh, Neophilenus, <coughs> We have this pattern in population dynamics <coughs> uh, in the three vegetal, uh, vegetational compartment. And we can see that uh, these adults were mainly collected uh, on the herbaceous cover, uh, still associated like names uh, to grasses, poaceae. Uh, the adults of this species, of this species were virtually absent in the olive agroecosystem in, in all the, 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 the vegetation compartment in the, in the summer months. And uh, here we are talking about uh, the Apulia situation. The highest abundance of uh, Cam Neophilenus campestris adults were registered uh, early in the season, in late May. As for the uh, Liguria situation, uh, the population abundance uh, is, is a bit, uh, has a, a different uh, distribution. Uh, also here, the adults were really associated with, uh, with gramineous plants. Uh, also in Liguria, we, we failed to, to, to collect uh, adults of this species uh, during summer months in the, in the different uh, vegetation compartment of the olive agroecosystem, but the highest abundance of uh, adults of Neophilenus were registered late in the season during autumn. As for the Afrophora alni that we only found in uh, the Liguria region, uh, most of the adults were collected on uh, woody hosts including uh, olive canopies, uh, but also oaks that mm, this species like, like, uh, like also, also Philenus like oaks a lot. And the highest density, although these densities were not very high, but were registered in June and then they decreased during, during the summer. I would like to point out an interesting uh, uh, feature about the abundance of spittlebag adults on olive trees over the season, uh, which is differential between Apulia and Liguria region in relation to the phenological stage of olive trees. In Apulia, uh, we observe uh, a good number of adults vi uh, on the, we collected on the canopies of olive only for a a, quite, a restricted wind, window of time uh, from May, as, so, as soon as they emerge as adults, until the early July, uh, in correspondence of flowering and the very beginning of fruit development of olive uh, trees. While in the Liguria region, the presence of uh, adults, of Philenus on olive canopies, is more extended 
uh, and they are present well beyond the, the flowering period uh, and, and, and the whole uh, fruit uh, development and even during fruit maturation. The, 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 epidemiologi the potential epidemiological consequences of this uh, um, uh, presence on the olive is, is quite clear, I guess. As for the horse plant association, I, I, I underlined in green the Fabaceae and in red the Asteraceae plants. And you can see that in, in the Apulia olive uh, groves, most of the spittle bugs, uh, nymphs, uh, were associated with Fabaceae, while uh, most of the, of, the, of the nymphs in the Liguria region uh, were associated with uh, uh, Asteraceae, uh, plants in the family Asteraceae. Uh, this uh, host, plant selection, uh, host plant selection is also driven by the, the, the different floral composition of the ground cover of the, of the olive uh, groves, uh, in the sense that there were more um, uh, more fabace in in uh, in southern in in the olive uh, groves of Apulia uh, and more asteraceae in Liguria. As for the host plant association of uh, Afrophoralni nymphs, uh, we found that uh, they prefer or at least they select uh, mostly asteraceae. And uh, as for uh, Neophilenus campestris, both in uh, northern and southern Italy, this species is really strongly associated with plants in the family Poaceae, with gramineous plants. I just want to remember that uh, <coughs> results that are consistent with the one uh, that we obtained in, in this research have been found in another uh, field-based research conducted in, in Apulia region in a, in a high number of olive groves uh, that were located both in the infected areas and outside the infected area. And then I go to the conclusion. Uh, we, we can simply conclude that the phenological pattern in the two regions is, is similar if refer to chronological time, but is different if we refer to uh, physiological time. And this can be due uh, to a non-linear component in the temperature development uh, rate function of Philenus pumarius. Uh, the population density was higher, uh, that we observed, was higher in the olive groves of the Liguria region uh, compared to the one in Apulia, but this one were located in the Bari area, not in the Salento infected area. Eh? And then uh, we confirmed the high polyphagy of, the, of Philenus pumarius. And uh, we noticed that uh, Afrophoralni has a, a similar host range of, uh, uh, like the one of Philenus pumarius, while Neophilenus strictly associated with Poase. And then uh, we observed this uh, extended uh, period of uh, presence of adults in, uh, uh, of uh, Philenus in, in olive uh, canopy in Liguria compared to uh, the Apulia. And, uh, and then with this I, I conclude because time <laughs> is over and I want to thank EFSA for funding uh, this uh, research. Uh, all the data uh, are uh, included in the um, final report which is published on the EFSA journal and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you Domenico. Any questions for Domenico? Uh, thank you Domenico. Here? I don't know if you can, can see, see me. You. Okay. Uh, I had two questions indeed. The first one is, uh, have you found any difference in be between the coastal uh, sampling site and the uh, sampling site in the interior, in Liguria especially? Uh, we found some differences, but they are not consistent. Uh, I cannot draw a conclusion on that. Then uh, if you consider that we only had one uh, olive uh, grove uh, on the coastal uh, area, one in the inland for each of the two sites, 
uh, I would be very prudent in concluding this. And there are so many factors affecting the, the, the population level and those plant selection of the spittle bug in, in, in this agroecosystem that I wouldn't go too far. Okay, and the second question is, uh, um, you, you, you say that adults disappear in, for a short, for like one month or two months in summer, and then they reappear in September and October. Is that explainable by migration, or it's just that you cannot find them and then suddenly they appear uh, again? Okay, uh, this is a feature that has been observed not only uh, by us in our research, but uh, also by other uh, uh, authors that did uh, surveys uh, in Spain, in Greece, and so on. And uh, in our case, this was particularly true for Neophilenus, uh, but uh, to some extent is also true for uh, Philenus pumarius. The reason for that is hard to say because uh, until you have not uh, <laughs> uh, robust data on that, and we have not, at least uh, personally I have not, uh, we can, uh, colleagues, they talk about some kind of estivation. Uh, I don't know what estivation exactly means, if it means that uh, insects uh, are uh, in a kind of... Uh, uh, stenobiosis condition, so they don't move, they, they stay uh, hidden somewhere, or if they really move in some way, migrate, in my opinion, is a, is, a, is, a, is a term which is a bit too strong, but they can move to, to, to other vegetation, we cannot exclude it, but this is largely unsolved. Eh? Okay, I think we have time is over for questions, we thank Domenico for the very nice, important presentation. Okay, uh, our last speaker of this session is Sabina Avozani, uh, University of Trento, Italy. Uh, use of vibrations to manipulate the behavior of the metal spirobug Philenus spumarius. Good morning, everybody. So I'm Savina Bosani, and I work uh, uh, with uh, Valerio Mazzoni at Fondazione Edmund Mack on the vibrational communication of uh, insect pests. So as you well know, uh, after the introduction of uh, Xylella fastidiosa in southern Italy, Philenos pumarius became a serious threat for the European olive culture because it's a competent vector and an efficient factor that transmit the bacterium from infected olive trees to healthy olive trees. And in this way, the transmission of the disease is completed. As you just can see in the picture, there is a, a uh, pardon, a olive tree affected by the disease. He, uh, Philenus pumarius is an abundant and widespread insect. He's highly polyphagous and his adult stage, so the mating stage, uh, the mating uh, period uh, of Philenus pumarius is from April to January, the maximum as we, uh, that can arrive. So in the novel field of applied biotremology, pests can be controlled by means of vibrations. So uh, they, uh, transmitting species-specific vibration, we can manipulate the mating behavior of the insect. As you can see in these pictures, we can Pardon, this is terrible. Uh, we can see the, uh, develop, uh, the attract attractive trap by means of vibration for the stink bug Aliomorpha halis. And uh, on the, in the other picture, we can see the vibrational vineyard to, man to disrupt mating in the leaf hoppers Caphideus titanus. So, since we want to find a similar method for Philenus pumarius, the first steps are to unveil the mating behavior of the insect and the associated vibrational signals. This information, together with the ecology, the phenology of the biology of the insect, will allow us to find or design at least vibrational manipulation experiments in order to find in the future a vibrational control technique for Philenus pumarius. 
I already characterized the vibrational communication of Philanus Pumarius and the male and the female repertoires. So the male and the female both have calling signals that they emit spontaneously on the plant. The male also interact with other males with a male-male signal, while a courtship signal is addressed to the female. The female, on the other hand, can respond to the male, so have a response signal, but also can reject males with a rejection signal. In this scheme, you can see the how mating occurs, so the pair formation. Everything starts with a female calling, then the male responds with a courtship, and uh, with uh, the exchange of signals between the male and the female, the male can reach the female on the plant. I don't think you can hear the, the no, it's a pity. I prepared the duet between the male and the female, but if you want, uh, I can um, let you uh, uh, listen to it later. So, but the female doesn't st the female doesn't start to call immediately as she is a is adult, but starts to call when she has eggs inside the abdomen. So, starting from August, she starts to call, and she continues, and the rate uh, increases throughout the season. So, what I'm doing now, I tried two male signals, so the male calling signal and the male male signals to understand their role and to see if, it's, uh, if we can use it as manipulation strategy. But I also trying mating disruption uh, experiments and the repellent signals to see if uh, we can at least disrupt the mating or avoid the inoculation of the bacterium. I ask, kindly ask you to remind these two pictures because the male calling sound can be of two types. One real more complex and made of two I will not. <laughs> made of two uh, different elements, of one, a series of just one element. To understand the role of this signal, I, tried it, I transmitted it on to males, to females, but in June and also in September, if, see if different contexts can be important. I will show you just a part of the result because <laughs> there was a lot of analysis to do. So, for the males respond to the more complex signals uh, without any difference between June and September, while the, the percentage of reply male in was higher in June than in September, maybe because the males are younger. But which kind of responses? In June and in September, the males responded to these more complex signals in the same way. While, interestingly, in June, the males were responding with a courtship to the male signal in June and not in September. Maybe because it's a female mimicry. I mean, here the males are, are younger, so maybe more inexpert. They never heard a female because females in June, they don't call. So why responding like this? On the, in the, on the other hand, the females responded more to the males in September and in, and, uh, in September for both signals. But in this case, the females were just rejecting male for, in both, for both signals in June, while in September they were calling and responding with the male to calling signal, like, please take me. So, uh, <laughs> So that is what is expected, because in June, females are not receptive to mating. So these both signals were not used by males to increase the motivation of the females to mate, because they were always grumpy. So could this signal underlie uh, an aggregation or repellency? Take in, um, keep in mind that I was using a plant with five leaves, and I was placing my stimuli just on the fourth leaf, so I couldn't understand if males or females were climbing on the plant and staying where, they, where there was the stimuli, or going up, or staying down, or jumping off. Unfortunately, I couldn't see any significant differences between the control and the treatment, neither in June nor in September, neither in females nor in males, so it's not an aggregation signal. But they were neither jumping off the plant, so, to conclude about this signal, the role is not clear. At least we, coul we could exclude to use it as aggregation signal or repellent signals for any kind of manipulation technique. 
and is also not used by males to increase the female motivation. But we think that maybe a longer exposure could uh, make us understand about the role of this, of this signal. And uh, several trials will be done in the future for uh, better understand how to use this signal. The male-male signal could be used to as a repellency signal since it could rely on or to disrupt mating. We tried this signal on single males, on pairs of one female, one male, and we had a control group and a trial group to understand if the presence of the female and the male could have any effect. I will be sure, but uh, the only the male responded with another male male signal just in the trio group. So the presence of the male, the physical presence, was necessary to trigger this signal in Philenus pumarius. And we think that maybe odors can have an, uh, be an importance in the behavior of these insect. And we uh, excluded to use it to repel the insect from the plant since the males were not jumping off the plant. So let's go to the mating disruption. At the end of August, when the females are receptive to mating, I tried three kinds of stimuli. The female rejection signal, the male signal, a five seconds of white noise followed by five seconds of silence, played in loop for 20 minutes, and I compared the results with a control. Unfortunately, there were no significant differences. So I couldn't disrupt mating in this with those signals. But I had an idea. Let's use a continuous noise with a specific frequency range between uh, uh, that was covering the exact communication channel of the insect. So the frequency range where they communicate was completely covered. So they could not hear themselves. They could not uh, interact. In this case, I could disrupt the mating. In fact, the number of mating were significantly lower in the treatment compared to the control. So in this case, we were capable of interfering with the communication. So uh, is the efficiency really depended on the frequency range and the duration. We couldn't leave any silent gaps. Last but not least, repellency. I was trying, uh, I tried, uh, and these are preliminary results and I still continue on that. I'm playing re different repellent playbacks on two plants. In this with this design, I, I play for 24 hours a uh, really noisy and fastidious signal on two plants. Well, two plants are left silent, so without any sound. And I place four individuals per each plant. After 25 hours, I go and I count the insect on the plants, this to see if the treated plants uh, were uh, abandoned by the insects. So they were jumping and remaining maybe on the control plants or just leaving the, the plants. Until now, I couldn't find <laughs> any significant differences. And this likely depends on the fact that uh, we have to find a signal that has to be repellent. And in my opinion, this could be really uh, an interesting work because it could, we could avoid the nucleation of the bacterium if we don't we find something that is uh, fastidious, maybe also that interact with the feeding behavior. They couldn't neither feed on such plants and they at least will not colonize the olive trees. So to conclude, we could confirm with these experiments that mating relies on vibrational signals in Philenus pumarius. And then the manipulation by means of vibration is a feasible approach and is worthy to be pursued. However, we have to find the most suitable signals and to understand which are the, str the strategies that, that can be used and in which period we can use the different strategies. For instance, mating disruption, it's worthy to be used just when the females are receptive to mating while other strategies while attraction or repellency in, a, in the other period of the, of, the, of the season. So thank you for uh, your attention and thanks to other the people that helped me and gave me the opportunity to do this and to the funds that has been given. Well, very interesting presentation by Sabina.
uh, on behavior of these speedo bugs. Uh, any questions? Uh -huh. Have you ever tried to compare if different population of the hospital bug have different song? Uh, or, uh, for example, if you test uh, some uh, Apulia population, did they did they have the exactly the same message and the same way to sing? Or yeah, because uh, they also communicate with uh, Apulian populations. Can also communicate with, uh, for instance, Trentino's co population. And I also found a small uh, uh, place in a, in a valley where there is a lake, and it's really a microclimate, uh, cold, where the, the insects are a little bit morphologically diverse, different from uh, the Apulian and the other Trentino population, but they communicate and they can also mate. I don't know how about the fecundity and then the fertility, but they can uh, interact be between each other. Something that I could see is also that the, um, I don't know, maybe, since I don't have really robust statistical data to say, but just observation, the um, population from Bari, uh, they were, uh, the females were calling not in August, but in September. While the population in Trentino, they call from uh, August. So they become receptive to mating uh, later compared to, the, uh, to Trentino because it's ha northern Italy. Uh, and maybe this could be correlated with the onset of the maturation of the eggs. We still have time for more questions to Sabina. Bonjour. Rodrigo Krugner with the United States Department of Agriculture. Sabina, have you tried or have you thought about doing the playbacks uh, with silent gaps uh, for the disruptive uh, signal instead of a continuous uh, playback so that you're not, so you're preventing non-target effects for beneficial insects. Uh, maybe it was not uh, really clear, but in the first mating disruption that I've tried, there were five seconds of white noise, but really broadband. So it was from zero to uh, 4,000 uh, hertz. And if I leave a silent gap of just five seconds, the male can reach the female. Because uh, the duet between the male and the female is continuous. So once the, the, from the onset of the male courtship, the male continues throughout all the, 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 the duet. So in those five seconds of silence, they could communicate and, and the male can reach the female. So it could not disrupt the mating if I leave the uh, silent gaps. We have time for more one question, perhaps. Over there. Okay. Um, Sabrina. Sabrina. Do, you Sorry. do you have an idea about uh, the range uh, um, of this uh, vibration of communication? Yes, it's uh, from, uh, uh, well, if we, I just was covering with the continuous, um, with the continuous noise, I was covering just the female range, not the male range, because the male range goes from sev 60 uh, hertz to even one, uh, almost 2000, because it's a broadband pass, yes, more, also broadband pulses and harmonic elements, while the female uh, just uses harmonic elements that goes from uh, 150 hertz to a uh, maximum, uh, the last harmonic that you can see, it's about 1,400 hertz. So I just have to cover this uh, female response, since it's the female response that gives to the male the vibrational cues, while I don't want to also, if I, I don't like to cover such a broadband uh, channel, uh, usually just cover the female response and not the male channel of communication. Any other question? Yes, one, one. It's just a, a curiosity. 
Uh, do you know in the case of, for example, Neophilenus campestris, it exists the same communication system? And if yes, is possible a, a, an interference between the two species when they coexist in the same mm -hmm. orchard? Uh, I don't know if they... No, well, there are work by Cheskin, a Russian uh, uh, researcher, and it's Neophilenus campestris, right? You, uh, the, the question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, they use vibration. He didn't uh, characterize the male, the female signals, and the duet, but uh, it's like the, the um, communication really is the really, uh, likely rely on vibrational signals. Also because odors, since uh, their antennae are not really developed or anyway, really, um, there are not, uh, usually Afrofori, they have not uh, communica ca chemical communication systems. So once you can uh, characterize the vibrational signals associated to mating, it's possible also to interfere. You have just to find the right strategy. Okay, I think our, our time. Maybe one, one last question? Quick question. No? Okay, so... Um, Thank you. I, we thank uh, Sabina for, for the nice presentation. And now I invite all the other, you can stay, Sabina, yeah. <laughs> now I invite all the other presenters for, for the discussion. Okay, so in this session we had uh, uh, different aspects related to vectors that were uh, discussed, from transmission to how to study this uh, interaction of uh, in vectors with uh, particular plants and bacteria, with uh, uh, this hybrid capture method. Also, this another method for measuring this how, how far the, the speedo bugs can move, and we saw that this can be dependent on some factors, for example, the, 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 the plant, the plant cover, olives or meadow. We had a, a very nice uh, presentation also by uh, Domenico on the host plant association and phenology of the speedo bugs, and finishing with this uh, very intriguing work on the acoustic communication behavior. So we have a, a wide range of studies here in this session, so uh, it's open for, for questions, if, uh, for a discussion, if you would like to. There's one, one question in the first line here. Oh, yes, I have a question for Domenico. Um, he, you said that uh, you noticed that the, during the summer the preference of uh, Philenus for especially some shrubs and other perennial uh, plants uh, in the within or uh, close to the to the olive orchard. Uh, do you do you have an idea to um, if it's possible to use it as uh, uh, for a, a strategy? of traps uh, uh, adult in this step with these plants? Uh, okay, in theory, why not? Uh, the, if, for example, these uh, wild uh, shrubs, trees, uh, undergo um, uh, to a less dramatic uh, water stress, during the dry summer months, maybe they, this can be the reason of why they are more attractive. Uh, they can eventually be attracted on these uh, uh, plants, shrubs, and eventually we can limit some uh, 
for example, spotted insecticide application uh, rather than uh, widespread insecticides, but this uh, really needs uh, a careful evaluation because uh, in terms of uh, relative amount of uh, population that are... Uh, we, we already have good data on that, but uh, this needs uh, further validation. But in theory, the, 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 the trap plant strategy uh, can be can be used. Another uh, conclusion that can be drawn from the same uh, phenomenon is that uh, maybe uh, clean olive groves <laughs> host uh, less uh, potential vectors. So uh, these plants are uh, dangerous in a way, or uh, we can. Uh, uh, see the, the same phenomenon for a, from an opposite perspective and using them as a, as a trap. Here, Alberto, in the front. Oh, there it was. In the back. Hey. Here. This is not working. Hi, this is uh, Miguel Miranda, University of the Balearic Islands. It's also, sorry, it's also a question for Domenico. <laughs> uh, it was not clear for me very much uh, when you related the seasonal pattern of the vectors and the phenology of the trees, in particular the olive trees. It was not clear for me if you were uh, saying somehow this is also having uh, an impact or an influence on the cycle of the vector, or was it just because the insects are more in on the tree and then the risk of transmission could be higher? Or do you expect any difference on the cycle between the south and the north because of the vectors, adults spending more time on the trees compared to the south that they are not? No, the the, the so latter much. hypothesis is the one I suggested. I mean, uh, the fact that uh, under the condition of Liguria regions, where luckily so far we have no xylella, although it has been spotted very close, uh, the ST53 in Manton uh, in the neighboring region. But anyway, under the Ligurian situation, we, uh, we observe uh, a longer period of, um, we observe Philenus adults for a longer period on olive canopies, in my opinion, represents uh, a risk factors, a risk factor, because uh, they can eventually transmit the bacterium for a prolonged time. And uh, if we consider that uh, in Apulia, in, in the Salento area, although uh, the, most of the adult population uh, visit and feed on olive canopies for a restricted time, we observe a dramatic, dramatic epidemics. Uh, I mean, we, we, can, we should be a little bit away. I don't want to panic, <laughs> but uh, in my in my my feeling is that uh, uh, the Liguria region is really at risk. Uh, is at risk because of a high population uh, level of the vector, of uh, very homogeneous landscape in terms of uh, olive uh, groves that are really continuous each other and also because of this uh, behavior of the vector that uh, visit for a prolonged time the, the olive trees. That's it. Okay, thank you. I can add uh, some elements uh, for, the, for the first question but could be also for the second. In Corsica, the, I may say it like every time, just to joke with Mark, my Corsican friend, is very different from the continent. And we find, uh, uh, we find the Philenus mostly, if not only, on cystus. <laughs> and uh, of course, if you cut cystus, then they go elsewhere. And they can be a threat, probably, because they can develop an asteroid. But for some reason, they are 
specifically associated with uh, cystus, cystus monspadiosensis, mm -hmm. and mostly that one. And the population are huge on, on that tree. And I would say if you, if you sweep elsewhere, you find nothing. And during the, the very hot season in July, the first time we came in, in Italia, in Corsica for the crisis, when they first discovered the Zivella bear, we sweep with the turcos. Everybody was afraid that we find it in olive groves, so we sweep during hours and hours and hours and find zero. And now we have uh, <coughs> some more collect there, and we find some of a few felinus during the hot season on, on, on the canopy, on, on olive trees as well. But the situation is quite, is quite different uh, on the island compared to the continent. Alberto here. Yes, uh, it's uh, true that th that situation you are talking about in the south of France is the same in Spain. We, we almost don't find any filenos during the summertime, very few. We, we cannot find them. So, yeah, the situation, it, it should be there. There is more than one type of filenos around Europe, and it's probably there are some genetical differences and host plant preferences that could explain this. Well, the, the question was more uh, related to movement uh, and migration. Yes, the Neophilenus campestris, uh, um, we know now that they have to move during the summertime somewhere. And uh, in the case of the study by Jan, uh, you showed that most of the Philenus, uh, in this case Philenus espumarius, move uh, maximum two kilometers after 200 days. That was your conclusion of the major conclusion? Experiment doesn't last 20, 200 days. The um, statistical distribution can be used to obtain estimate from 210 days. We conduct an experiment for maximum 17 days. 17 days. Okay, but you didn't look uh, for m more than 200 meters no. across the, 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 the point of release. Okay. So this is more like short range dispersion in those in that radius. You cannot estimate how many or how how much may they fly out of those 200 meters. No, uh, we didn't um, we didn't collect uh, any sample with outside. We try to estimate for long dispersal, not long jump dispersal, but a long dispersal using the techniques of uh, boundaryness collection. Mo modeling techniques. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions to the speakers? Yeah, there are two here. Hi, um, my name is Alexandra Khan. I'm from UC Berkeley. I had a question for Joan Eves. I, I really appreciated the efforts to flesh out hosts and understanding of the system beyond just the agricultural range. And I'm curious if after getting data about the plant genetics that are in the mouth parts, if you plan to do testing to see if Xylella is present in those plants. You mentioned that there's uh, huge amounts of positive vectors without any known hosts. So I'm really curious about that gap. Well, I would say for standing, what we have <laughs> research is not, so is not uh, really uh, interesting. And on that topic, we have nearly nothing very exciting. But I would say that uh, we test, uh, uh, we now fight with the methodology mostly and expect to have uh, really more result on that specific question uh, uh, later on. At the moment, we don't have really uh, answer and uh, it's difficult for us even, um, how can I explain that? If, if we want to go to, to symbiont or to microbiome, we, we go into a world where, where you have a lot of uh, prevalence of the genes into the cells. And this makes trouble if you want at the same time capture xylella at a very low rate and if you have probe with a very high 
prevalence of uh, plenty uh, complementary strain uh, and uh, DNA in, in, in the genome of the, the total genome you extract. So for the time being, constricting probes that enable you to spot everything, including the microbiome well, is quite, is quite difficult. I guess I was imagining more that once you were able to identify plants, you might, it might be really worthwhile to do a second sampling of the plants themselves without the insects. Uh, in fact, we, we are not very sure, as I said, that uh, what we identif identify is a sap. We, we pretty believe that uh, what we identify was uh, some uh, uh, tissue of the plant that were still in the, the mouse part and that we extract. But identifying plant and identifying a very rare uh, bacteria like Zilela somewhere, in, because we use uh, anti-insect, we make a total DNA extraction. We don't take just the head or whatever. We, we take the whole DNA, the whole genome, one extraction scratch. And from that, you have two rare DNA that you try to find. So you can adapt the method to find rare trace of DNA, and that's easy. But if you want to add something which is very prevalent in, in the sample, that's, that's more tricky. Well, I wish you the best. More questions? Yeah? No? Well, I, I would like to make a, uh, maybe to summarize some of the information uh, concerning timing. We have a lot of information on so phenology of the insects, now the behavior, uh, the, the acoustic behavior, which ideas of, um, of um, disrupting in September when the f females are responsive or for calling, and also integrating with these phenologists. Uh, maybe a question to, to Sabina and to, and to um, Domenico on timing. If you like to uh, uh, give advices on different methods to, to control the spittle bugs in a situation like Italy, uh, combining cultural, uh, behavioral methods, uh, which ones could be uh, used first and then second uh, if you would design a management uh, system? Uh, well, um, I will, I always say that uh, with vibration alone, you cannot really everything is not the cure for everything so you always have to integrate them with maybe chemical cues visual cues uh, or anyway the um, uh, as you say the uh, cultivations all uh, the orchards how you keep them the uh, the treatments and everything but i will say that maybe you can use uh, uh, push and pull techniques maybe e uh, when the insects are moving towards the olive canopies, so to attract them on other plants and to avoid the colonization and so the inoculation of the bacterium in the period when they go to the olive orchards, and then maybe to decrease the population with a mating disruption techniques. technique, you can use them starting from August or in September in the Apulian region, because in northern part of Italy, I imagine that they start to, to call and to mate starting from August, at least in uh, northern Italy, in Trentino, what I've seen. However, we also have to evaluate that the females have a spermatheca, but I rather imagine that a uh, last sperm preference, or anyway, only because of the presence of the spermatheca, it doesn't mean that the female used the sperm. That because I've observed some mating also in, uh, um, in June, but they, I will not call them acceptance. The female were not accepting the mate. So I don't think, or maybe they don't stock the sperm, or they will not use that sperm. They will just use the sperm after a mate choice. So starting from August or September. Uh, okay. The the current knowledge on uh, phenology and population dynamics of uh, spittlebugs in uh, in 
Italy, in Southern Europe, I guess they, they suggest, they are already implemented in a way because we have a rapid turnover of uh, research into the, into the field uh, for these aspects. Uh, so the main uh, two points are uh, uh, an infal population peak has been identified in April. So we concluded uh, and we suggested that the best moment to apply, for example, soil tilling to destroy, to, uh, destroy the, the, the herbaceous cover where the nymphs develop is uh, actually uh, by mid-April. Because at this time of the season, we know that all the eggs already hatched, so all the nymphal population is there. And if we apply soil tilling in that moment, or if we are unable to apply soil tilling, we, we apply alternative uh, control tools, that moment is the best one against uh, nymphs. And this is the best strategy, of course. As for the adults, so far, it's really different to figure out uh, control measure different from uh, insecticides. Uh, of course, uh, Sabina and others are developing uh, new possibilities. But uh, back to the real world now, uh, insecticides are the one. And uh, the fact that uh, in different areas we can identify different periods of uh, uh, in which uh, the, 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 the vector is present on olive canopies uh, suggested as the right moment to, uh, to apply uh, control measure. Uh, for that, I can mention the national plan, uh, the emergency plan, the Italian national emergency plan uh, for the control of Xylella. Uh, in the first one, uh, insecticide application were uh, generally mentioned over the whole uh, summer period. In the new one, uh, there is a suggestion to focus on, uh, especially uh, in, early, in the early season, in this uh, restricted window of time. Okay. That's it. Oh, very good. So different kind of uh, studies, and that we will provide uh, information for management, as you, as you can see in the future. And OK, uh, I think we are, we are ready for break. It's 4 o'clock. So I, ever, I invited everybody to go for, for a coffee now, and thank you for the attendance in this session. <laughs>